Welcome to Jesus Changes Everything, a daily podcast dedicated to providing a fresh look at the ancient and glorious truth that Jesus not only reigns, but is busy about the business of bringing all things under subjection, that celebrates the wonder and the glory that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. For today's ism, given that it's a Tuesday, I thought that we would cover animism. And there's a good reason for that. I'm persuaded, maybe persuaded is a little too strong of a word. I am partially persuaded that there is something wise in animism that we have missed out on. Animism is the belief that everything has a kind of, uh, well, how do I put it? Everything has a kind of soul to it, that all natural objects has have a soul or a, a level of some kind of uh, consciousness. And typically, in uh, those who embrace an evolutionary view of uh, religion, uh, animism is considered to be profoundly uh, primitive, that uh, when people believe that there's a river god and a tree god and a storm god and all these different gods that sort of inhabit or uh, indwell uh, all these natural phenomena, that this is something that, that uh, humans supposedly mature out of through a process. And while I'm in no way interested in defending a, a view that suggests that there are gods for all of these things, uh, I am inclined to think at the very least that there may be more consciousness out there than we typically give credit for, that, that animism uh, sort of uh, can rightfully push against our propensity to uh, look at the world in mechanistic terms. Let me give you a couple of examples uh, uh, that maybe reflect this concept out of the Bible. One, uh, we know that uh, stars in the Bible, it says of God that he calls them by name. He calls them by name. C.S. Lewis in the uh, Voyage of the Dawn Treader has a wonderful conversation where uh, a kind of prudish, modernist little kid meets a retired star, and he insists that stars are uh, hydrogen or helium or both. I don't remember which it is. And the star says that's what stars may be made of, but it's not what they are. And I really appreciated that and agree with that. Uh, if, if that sounds, sounds a little too far out for you, I know a guy, very sound doctrinally guy and, and a very godly person, um, who said that if God's people were to fail to rejoice and celebrate over Jesus, that the rocks would cry out. Of course, that's Jesus who said that. Jesus said that during his triumphal entry uh, on Palm Sunday, that when he was coming into uh, the city of Jerusalem on the donkey, and the, and the Pharisees said, Jesus, make these people be quiet. He said, if they're quiet, the rocks will cry out. Jesus also commanded the wind and the waves to obey him, and they did. In the church where I serve, Sovereign Grace Fellowship, just the other day, we sang a beautiful song that includes a line that goes something like this. The wind and the waves still know his name. There seems to be a, at least a hint that there is some kind of consciousness in these things. When God sends the ravens to feed Elijah, uh, same kind of thing. Again, I'm not saying this means we can't eat things. I'm not saying that, uh, I'm, I'm certainly not embracing any kind of pantheistic view where everything's a part of God at all. I, what I'm saying is that, is it possible that if not all creatures, but if at least more creatures than we typically think of, 
uh, actually have some kind of level of consciousness. One of the appeals of this idea to me uh, is the idea that in the fullness of time, when everything is made right, I, I love the idea of everything rejoicing and celebrating uh, over the glory of Christ. Uh, again, here's another example from the Old Testament where uh, the, the mountains and the trees are said to celebrate and to rejoice. The trees clap their hands. The mountains go forth before him. These these are the kinds of things that we look at and we say, well, that's a really pretty metaphor. When I think maybe we're supposed to look at it and be shocked and stunned and in awe and to actually believe that it's true. All creation, all creation, not just human beings, all creation will praise him and magnify him. Not exactly the same thing as that primitive animism that trembles before the storm god and tries to appease it with uh, worship. But also not exactly the same thing at all of the modernist who looks at the world as if it were barren and sterile and quiet and in essence dead so put a little animism in your life just a little and i think if you do so you'll be more faithful to the word of god my father used to say to me son when you have a cannon fire it now, what he meant by that little aphorism was simple. If you have something in your possession that can be an effective tool to accomplish your ends, then use it. Well, my goal is to see the reign of Jesus made known over all things. And God has blessed me with the most powerful tool for that in giving me a partner and my wife, Lisa. She is a source of wisdom and encouragement and insight and uh, strength, and she's a gift. And I want to share the wisdom that she gives with you, which is why I created for the Jesus Changes Everything podcast opportunities for her to be a part of it. She joins me in our sacred marriage segments together. She talks with me about the movies that we watch in our curating your movie library segments. But in this segment, The Purpose Driven Wife, it's just her. She writes for her blog from time to time at that same name, The Purpose Driven Wife. She posts on The Purpose Driven Wife Facebook page, and she has wisdom there that I would like to see reach a larger audience. Thus, The Purpose Driven Wife on the Jesus Changes Everything podcast. I hope you enjoy. Are you walking in hard places? 1 Thessalonians 2, 11 and 12 says, just as you know how we were, exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you, as a father would his own children, so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. The evidence of our calling is determined by our walk. Too many walk aimlessly, carelessly, frantically, sloppily, or even angrily through life. Others walk boldly intentionally, confidently, determinedly, happily, and assuredly, knowing the hope of their journey. Why do some try so little, destroying their own lives, seem so costly to the ones who value the breath they've been given? Trajectories can be that defining moment that wakes us up from our self-destructive stupor. When it finally clicks, our eyes open and we realize it is not a dress rehearsal, we come alive to the reality that life is a precious gift. We get one earthly opportunity. One. What are you doing with yours? 
Has God called you to walk in hard places? Is God reminding you today that you were underutilizing, misusing, or even worse, ignoring the gift of life? You can change today. Let's go deep and identify one of our greatest struggles. Relationships. That's where we mostly walk wounded. The most difficult calling is to walk with people who bring us harm. Shattered lives are like jagged, splintered pieces of glass. They cut, they bleed, and ooze from their wounds. What do religious people do? They walk around it or avoid it. Why? Because they know the risks involved. People avoid risks and relationships that cost them. Hate to hear it? Me too. But someone needs to say it. I am praying that even as God begins to move upon your heart, that you will walk in a manner worthy of your calling. A calling you may not have known about or had rejected over time. Maybe your feelings were hurt by someone who rejected you. Maybe you just got tired of what you viewed as hypocrisy, or maybe you just stopped caring, period. Your life is going by. You're missing out and the clock is ticking and you are completely remiss in understanding one day your very breath will cease. Your opportunities will be no more. Life will come to its final tragic moment and then it's all over. No more breath, no more opportunity, no more you. To those who hate their lives, stop. Don't give up. No pit is too deep that God isn't deeper still. Isaiah 59.1 Get back in the game. Reach out. You don't have to walk alone. God calls us to risk. Yes, it's true. The true mark of our character is to walk the hard places. Dangerous journeys of faith build trials, yet we don't give up. We go to our fellow man. We are the hands of Jesus as we reach into the dark, slimy pit and pull our brother or sister out. Restore the broken. Give hope to the hopeless. Risks are not for the faint of heart. Risks, like broken glass, can pierce our flesh, leaving scars. But who will dare walk in such places? Will you? Will you risk for the sake of another? The scope of our mission field is right in front of us. Broken, messy, bleeding souls, lost and despairing. They need you and I to speak life to them and over them. God calls us to hard tasks, spiritual warfare, and a tenacity that fights to go on instead of throwing in the towel. What is your job in the practical, the here and now? Show the hurting, broken, angry, aggravating humans around you how to take all those shattered pieces and make something whole, something beautiful. Even if you're afraid, do it afraid. Perspective changes everything. What is a credible profession of faith? Well, I am certainly not at all immune to making mistakes. I do try to be careful with my words. I'm asking you, my listeners, to show care with my words as well. I don't pretend to have the capacity to see into anyone's heart. Nor does my library card give me access to the Lamb's Book of Life. I don't know for certain who will go to heaven and who will not, who is currently a believer and who is not. I do know, however, that the Bible does provide us some standards by which we are called to make tentative judgments. Among those standards is this, confessing the faith. Our faith confesses, remember, that it is not our confessing the faith that wins us eternal life. Jesus did that. His life, death, and resurrection 
are the cause of my redemption. I, by his grace, rest in him alone. But those who have been redeemed by him confess him. As such, I would argue that one cannot have a credible profession of faith while denying what his church has said about who he is. To deny the Trinity, to deny the Incarnation, to deny his birth of a virgin, his perfect, obedient life, his substitutionary death, his bodily resurrection, his ascension to the throne, his future return, his deity, his humanity, is to deny him. The great bulk of our ecumenical creeds in church history gave themselves to hashing out these sticky issues. They deemed their work as involving an exposition of essentials to the faith, and I concur. The best summary the church has come up with, in my judgment, is found in the Apostles' Creed. Its very function was to summarize as clearly and as succinctly as possible the essentials of the faith, that without which the faith would no longer be. The creed, of course, is not infallible. No one suggests it was breathed out like the scripture was. It could, hypothetically, be in error. That said, I don't believe it is in error. It may, however, have not quite covered all that should have been covered. What is missing from the Apostles' Creed is a clear exposition of penal substitutionary atonement and the necessity of resting on that work alone for salvation. It's possible to find these glorious truths in the creed, but it is certainly not easy. At the end of the day, these two, the penal substitutionary atonement of Christ and the necessity of resting on that work alone, can themselves be summarized even more simply. Only those who look to Christ as their one true sacrifice and cry out, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, have a credible profession of faith. No, one doesn't take a theology exam proctored by St. Peter at the pearly gates. And certainly one might be ignorant of the history of these theological debates. The man, after all, that Jesus spoke of, who cried out, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, knew nothing about Jesus, his suffering for us on the cross, or his resurrection. These things hadn't happened yet. Yet, according to Jesus, he went home justified. There is a yawning gap between Apollos who knew nothing of the baptism of the Holy Spirit until he was instructed, and the Pharisees, who positively affirmed that Jesus did his works by the power of the devil. Apollos was reborn, indwelt by the spirit that he knew precious little of. The Pharisees knew the spirit and hated him. I am, as always, open to opposing arguments. I don't think anything that I've said so far would be any different from that which the true church has always affirmed. Nothing controversial there. If I have erred, my only response is this. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. You've been listening to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast, a production of Dunamis Fellowship, 
the teaching outreach of Dr. R.C. Sproul Jr. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to subscribe, which you can do at all the usual outlets, to tell your friends, and to spread the word. To learn more about the work of Dunamis Fellowship, please visit rcsproljr.com and join us next time on Jesus Changes Everything.